Okay, so this is the follow-up to the Ask Me Anything quiz. And the reason for that is I was making the video for the other one, and for some reason my computer cut out. And by the time I got around to finishing that up, well, you can see I've gone back into vacation mode here. So let's go ahead and get started and finish answering some of the questions that you guys asked me. Um, so the next set of questions had to do with uh, the process of canonization. Um, one question is, how and why are the books of the Bible that we read the selected ones that they are? To help clarify my question, like we learned already, the Catholic Bible has books that we don't study in the Protestant Bible. And there is evidence of other religious texts or writings in the same period of a lot of books we have studied that just didn't make the cut for any version of the Bible. So do we Protestants only study the books or writings chosen to be collected and to be studied called the Bible? I hope this makes some sense. And yes, it does make some sense. Um, so the simple answer to the question is what makes the canon of the Bible is the community the community of Jews or Christians <laughs> my son is going to say hello for this video um, Elijah <laughs> uh, the community of the uh, the community of Jews or Christians comes together to make uh, to make the <laughs> to select which books belong in the Old Testament. Now, as the question asker knows, there are other books out there that you have to pick from. So some examples of some books that existed at the time of the Old Testament. This is ridiculous. Um, but, um, there are people who are writing things about Adam and Eve other than the author of Genesis. There's a book in the old, there's a book called the life of Adam and Eve. There's a book called um, the book of Jubilees, which is a retelling of the story of the book of Genesis. Uh, these are all books that were available to, uh, um, to the Jewish community to select from on what they thought should belong in the canon or not. And so they, as a community, decide on this. And it's not, it's not a formal event. It's not like there's an election or there's a council or something like that. Instead, it's a very informal process of different communities coming together and saying, you know what? The life of Adam and Eve has some weird stuff in it, and it does. It's just not something that we're going to say is truly from God. And so because of that, we're going to throw that one out. Then decades later, they go through the, you know, they continue to look at their books and they say, you know what? We just don't read the book of Jubilees anymore. Why? Because, well, it's got some weird stuff in there too. And so they throw that one out as well. And the process of canonization takes hundreds of years to go through. Now, do we still study those books? Yes, absolutely. Those are, some, those are actually very important books in terms of establishing background for us. They help tell us what is it that's going on in Judaism or Christianity at the time that these particular books were being, at the time other books of the Bible were being written? It tells us what kinds of questions were the Jews asking? What are they interested in? It helps inform us about what, um, what else, um, it helps inform us about the culture of the time. And so these are very valuable books. Now, do we study them in church? No, not necessarily. But I assure you, scholars are looking at these books, and that scholarship is making its way into commentaries. It's making its way into Sunday school materials. Um, it's making It makes its way into my class as well. So those books are definitely useful to us, even if we don't necessarily consider them scripture. And although there are some weird things in those books, you know, there's some actually really intriguing things in there, and some ideas from those books have made their way into popular Christianity. A lot of what we believe about, about angels comes to us, or at least some of what we believe about angels comes to us from, uh, from 
books that are not in the Old Testament. Book of Enoch is is a major contributor to what we tend to believe and buy into about angels. So great question there. All right, so um, let's keep going. Um, now there's a series of questions here about God. Uh, I'm going to read them off here. My question would have to be, is God a God of peace or of wrath? Many books in the Bible describe him as either wrathful or peaceful, never really both. Uh, why is God so cutthroat in the sense of if you do one, th one wrong thing and everyone dies? Why is there so much war in the Old Testament for land encouraged by God, but not as much war in the New Testament or even nowadays that's encouraged by God? Um, all these are great questions, and they all really are revolving around the issue of they're all revolving around the issue of God and his wrathfulness. Um, so a couple of things to say about that. Yeah. The first thing I would say is it's tempting for us to say God is wrathful in the Old Testament and he's a friendly guy in the New Testament. And I think we need to dispense with that idea. God can be quite wrathful in the Old Testament. He can be quite wrathful in the New Testament. Jesus has some mean things to say sometimes. Talks about people being burned up like fire uh, in, in the New Testament. Read the book of Revelation. You will see some serious punishment going on in the book of Revelation. Um, but I prefer not to emphasize the wrathfulness of God. Now it's there. I don't want to downplay it too much. I don't want to say that it's not there. But I'd rather say... Let's look at the ways in which God is a God of peace throughout the Old and the New Testaments. It's obvious in the New Testament. That's a Everybody knows about that. Jesus is as let the children come unto me, that kind of stuff. So let's talk about the peace, in the, the sense of peace in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 2 talks about how God will judge between the nations, and then he will cause the nations to beat their swords into plowshares. Um, what, what Isaiah 2 is driving at is this sense of God is going to reconcile all the nations of the world together to emphasize a peaceful world in which there is no more war. That is God's ultimate goal. Um, of course, Amos talks about the day of the Lord and the idea of God setting all things right. Now, could that be through a lot of violence? Yeah, it could be. But Amos doesn't explicitly say that necessarily. Um, the day of Lord can be a day in which God sets everything right and causes a great peace to come upon all uh, uh, to come upon all of us. Um, there is. A lot of emphasis in the Old Testament on the need for justice, justice amongst uh, uh, neighbors, uh, fair treatment of the poor. There is a call to love one another. All of these things speak to the fact that God is constantly calling the Israelites to be reconciled unto him. Now, if they don't reconcile themselves unto him, then yes. God is going to punish them. But the first option available to the Israelites is always this idea of God being peaceful and welcoming, welcoming to the Israelites. Now, so then why do we get all these portrayals of God being mean and wrathful and all that stuff? Well, a lot of this has to do with the Israelites' understanding of God. And this is a big question about. This gets into another means of interpreting the Bible. What is the Bible doing? The Old Testament is oftentimes people's reflections on the great mystery that is God. And the people of the Old Testament are people who live in a nation or were hoping to live in a nation. And they were living in a territory that was occupied by a foreign power, and they were hoping God would restore it someday. And so there is a natural sense of, well, the only way you're going to build a nation is by kicking out the Babylonians or the Persians or the Greeks or the Assyrians or whoever. And that's probably going to happen through warfare. That's the natural assumption amongst humans. 
And so the Israelites assume that God is going to be vindictive and he's going to destroy all of his enemies and all the enemies of the Israelites through this uh, massive battle or conquest or something along those lines. And that's an assumption that holds true all the way up until New Testament times. There are a lot of expectations in the New Testament uh, or amongst Jews living in the time of the New Testament that God is going to send a new David into the world who's going to kill the Romans and set them all free. And so a lot of what Jesus has to teach is to explain that's not the way this is going to work. That's not the way this is supposed to work. Jesus is going to build the kingdom of God through servanthood. And so I don't want to say that the Israelites misunderstood God. But what I think is fair to say is that the Israelites were getting one piece of the grand picture of God, and they were choosing to focus in on the fact that he was awesome, powerful, mighty, a warrior, and that's understandable because they want a warrior God to protect their nation. But of course, by the time God sends in Jesus, Jesus fills in the rest of that picture. Yes, God is dangerous. He is a dangerous and powerful lion um, who is capable of great wrath. But at the same time, though, God is an extremely merciful, loving, and forgiving God. And only a loving and merciful God would be capable of allowing the Israelites, who had forsaken God for decades, if not centuries, and worshipped idols, and worshipped false gods, and taken God for granted, only a merciful God would have allowed the Israelites the opportunity for repentance, A, for hundreds of years before he let the Babylonians conquer them, and then B, even after he lets the Babylonians conquer them. That punishment is never meant to be permanent. The punishments of God are always meant to be opportunities for learning and repentance. And so I would suggest that if we see God as a God of wrath in the Old Testament, a God of love and mercy in the Old Testament, we have not understood the Old Testament correctly. Instead, we need to go back and we need to see that there are strong threads of repentance throughout the Old Testament that are emphasized by the prophets in God's law and in the character of God's and in the character of God himself. Now, what does the wrath of God look like itself? I'm sure um, I will confess I'm not the right person to answer that question. And I don't know exactly what it would look like. I'm sure it would look something different to different people. I think the wrath of God can be individual punishment. I think the wrath of God can be collective punishment on people. I think the wrath, but I think the, but I think ultimately the wrath of God is God saying, fine, you go do it your way. The wrath of God is more about letting us go off and be on our own and honoring our choice to reject God. I think that's what. God's wrathfulness ultimately comes down to. And if we have a true understanding of who God is, I think the idea that God would let us go and honor our choice to just walk away from him, that's a scary thing. And I would be very afraid of what that would be like. All right. Well, hopefully that clarifies some issues about the wrath of God there. Um, The next set of questions is going to be, um, well, here's a good one about what made the Israelites go from constantly disobeying God to only wanting to worship and follow him. Um, I would very kindly and politely suggest, I think that you see, uh, I don't think you see this idea of disobedience 
and then sudden obedience. I think what you see is sometimes there's obedience and sometimes there's disobedience. And I think that's really just reflective of humans in general. Um, it's hard to be obedient to God because we have this very natural selfish desire. It's called sin. Um, sin is fun. It is. That's the reason why people do it. Um, but then you learn that sin may be fun, but it's also destructive. And so then people come back to God. Now, I assume what the question to ask her is talking about is this idea of these, of how the Israelites were very disobedient to God before the Babylonian exile. And then after the Babylonian exile, Ezra and Nehemiah paint this picture of God, of the Israelites being extremely faithful and obedient to the law. Um, I think what makes them want to be obedient is the fact that they've gone through, and I, I, I hope it's okay for me to, to say this, but I think it's an appropriate term. They've gone through hell and back. Um, they have seen they have seen their country be destroyed. They've seen um, their temple be torn down. They've gone through an extremely traumatic event. And when you go through an extremely traumatic event, sometimes that's what it takes for people to change. And I suspect that that's um, what causes this emphasis on obedience to the law that we find in Ezra and Nehemiah. So speaking of Ezra and Nehemiah. Let's move on to another question here, um, which is, oh, I've lost that question here. Where did it go? Um, two questions about the inner, about intermarriage in Ezra and Nehemiah. After reading the chapters on Ezra and Nehemiah, I have a concern regarding the view of intermarriage throughout the Old Testament. I understand that in the past, intermarriage has, got, has caused great sin for the Israelites, such as King Solomon and his many wives. But going as far as to disown your own family and even Ezra beating the husbands of, of, the, of these mixed relationships seems kind of out of the ordinary. Ezra and part of Nehemiah's views both contradict Isaiah's vision of union of all the races in the new house of Jerusalem. Why is that so? Outstanding question. What I would suggest, what I would suggest is that Ezra, let's go back to what I said a few minutes ago. Everybody who writes part of the Old Testament has a piece of God. I don't think anybody ever misunderstands God. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in Scripture. But I think when they are... But I think when you are a human and you're trying to understand divine revelation, that can be a little overwhelming, I would suspect. And so I think what is happening is that different people are picking up on different aspects of God's character. And because the people in Ezra and Nehemiah have gone through hell and back, and they have seen their country be destroyed because they have not been obedient to the law. What happens? What happens is that these people become extremely sensitive to the law that God has given them, and they start sensing God's emphasis on the need to obey this law, even to the point where it causes this very painful scene of divorce, the divorcing of foreign wives. This is where it's always important to balance scripture as the person who asked this question takes note. I would never want anybody to base their entire theology on one verse or a handful of verses. The Bible is a big book. It's a big book for a reason, because God's a big God. And so we need to understand that all of Scripture tells us something about God. And so I think that God, if this is possible, a, an aspect of God would be pleased that the Israelites were, will, were wanting to be obedient to him. Even if God was not pleased with the outcome, which would have been the divorcing of foreign wives. And so what God is, and so God gives us these other parts of the Bible to emphasize to us 
this need for peace and reconciliation. I don't think that God is opposed to intermarriage. I don't want anybody to listen to this video thinking that God is opposed to this idea of, uh, of interracial marriages or, or, or anything along those lines. I don't think the Bible supports anything along those lines at all. Um, I, I think the Bible, uh, I, I think that a, a fair and honest reading will find some instances where the Bible may speak again, will speak negatively about other nations and cultures. But overall, what God wants to emphasize is that we are all created in the image of God. And so there's no reason for any of us to say that one race, one ethnicity is superior to the next in any way. And so God is perfectly comfortable with this idea of intermarriage between different ethnicities. Um, and that was something that I think that the book of Ezra, that the people living in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah forgot about. And so you have the book of Ruth come along and say, hey, wait a second here. There's more to God and the law than just this literal obedience here. I love that Ruth and Ezra and Nehemiah emphasize this idea of marriage and give us this interplay um, about intermarriage. And it shows us how the Bible can be in conversation with itself and how we need more than one book of the Bible in order to truly understand who God is. So reading the Bible is very much about balancing different books of the Bible, different aspects of the Bible in order to fully and completely understand God's character. Great question. Um, now I can see that this video is already beginning to get as long as the last one. And that was not my intention here. So I'm going to fast forward here and, um, hit a, just one or two more questions here, and then we'll wrap all this up. Um, where did Jesus go when he uh, when he left the tomb and before he appeared to the women in, in three days, and where did he spend his time? Sh simple answer. I think Jesus went to the place where all people go when they die. Wherever that is, I don't know. But Jesus was dead like all other human beings. And uh, then he came back from the dead. There's a tradition that says Jesus went down to Sheol, possibly hell, and gathered up all the faithful people of the world and brought them up into heaven. But that's more of a tradition than something that's really found in scripture specifically. Um, why does God favor some things or people over others, such as in the cases of Israel or Jacob and Esau? Quick answer to that question. I don't think God does favor I think that it seems to us that God favors people. And I think what's going on, as we find out in the New Testament, is that God appears to favor the Jews for the benefit of the entire world. But when you read Romans 11, you will find that God actually has used the Jews for the benefit of the Gentiles and now, in the time of the New Testament, is using the Gentiles for the benefit of the Jews. God's plan, again, I'm, I'm following Paul in, in the book of Romans here, especially 9 through 11 and chapter 4. Um, God's plan has always been to create one united people who are faithful to, uh, who, who are ultimately faithful to him. Um, I'll go ahead and put a plug in for my own for my New Testament class uh, and say that if you're if you want more info about that, um, if you want more info about that, you can just read. You can listen to my lecture on on Romans, which is also on the YouTube channel here uh, for my for my New Testament students. Um, or you can take my New Testament class next semester. Um, continuing on here, if God knows all from the beginning to the future then why allow everything the Israelites did wrong to happen so that the way he has to fix it every time? I understand the punishment for their sins, but even further, why put the tree of knowledge in the garden if he already knew that Adam and Eve would fall into sin? Um, <laughs> that is a tough, tough question. Um, What I would suggest, 
is God honors human choice and his willingness to honor our choices and give us freedom and let us be creatures means that he has to be willing to let us make mistakes. I don't know how much sense this is going to make because I don't think many of you are parents yet, but I'm a parent. And I want my children to be able to be independent of me someday. Please, God, let that happen. <laughs> um, in order for them to be able to do that, I have to let them be able to screw up. I have to let them make mistakes so that they can learn to live on their own. And for some reason, God has created the world in such a way that he wants us to be able to be creatures who are independent and able to love him, but are also constantly growing towards him. So God's ultimate goal, God's ultimate objective is not to create is not to create a, a world that is perfect in the sense that nothing could ever go wrong. God's objective is to create a world that is perfect in the sense that we have been perfected through a long history of struggles. And that gets into another question somebody else asked. Why is there this sense of collective punishment in the Old Testament? And the reason for that is we're not individuals. We are humans who are in this world together. Um, this pandemic is a perfect example of the fact that it's very difficult for us to be truly independent and live on our own. We all need each other desperately. And so God allows us as a people, allows Israel as a people to make mistakes so that we as a people can work together to try to grow together to ultimately try to build something that God calls in the New Testament the kingdom of God, which is going to be this place where um, that Jesus will finally usher in, which is a place of hope and peace and prosperity and us all working and living together in harmony and as righteous beings and all those wonderful things. Well, this video is now close to 30 minutes long, and I just started preaching a little bit. I had a night, and I think what I said at the very end is a nice vision there. So I think that it's time to wrap this up. If I did not get to one of your questions, I'm sorry. I really am. Um, but um, I would, if, if I did not get to one of your questions, send me an email, and I will be happy to, to email you back and answer them for you. I hope you guys enjoy these. I hope these videos were not too long and that has detracted from it. Um, but I did want to try and give some thorough answers to all this stuff. So um, hope everybody's doing well. I will talk at you guys later. And since this is YouTube, remember to hit that like and subscribe button. Okay, guys? See you later. <sighs>